the speakers don't wish to be recorded, okay? And we will publish it uh, this all afterwards unless the speakers don't want it to be published. So, um, planujemo zapisati usi prezentaci i takoj opublikovati ih na YouTube, jakšu njeskajuti sa speakeri. Dobře, so já um, um, uh, můžu prodovžit uh, jezu. OK, so we've started recording. Um, so you may be wondering, why are we having this uh, conference? And, uh, and my thanks go to, go to Chris Coy for making this very nice um, design of the Ukrainian conference, because we're in LU, Lancaster University, learn language and make a difference. So uh, I will introduce myself quickly. Um, my name is uh, Timothy Douglas. I'm a lecturer at the School of Engineering and also at the Material Science Institute here at Lancaster University. So I'll explain briefly why we're having this conference and who is going to be speaking, also some practical matters, and then at the end, how we might continue after this, because this conference is also intended as an experiment. I um, am employed here as a lecturer in chemical engineering, so I help students to design uh, processes. I also do research into biomedical engineering. Uh, my field is biomaterials, so materials which you could implant in order to stimulate tissue regeneration. And I love collaborating with people from different countries, and I do so in lots of different languages. And I'm also a very keen language learner. And one of the things I try to do uh, in my job is to encourage people to combine languages and science, because I believe science and languages are often thought of as being two separate fields. I believe that if we combine them, then you know, si learning languages will help you to do more science, you know, through more collaboration, and the scientific world uh, will through the because people from all over the world are doing it that gives you excellent opportunities you know to learn languages so you can kill two birds with one stone or um uh, so as the ukrainians say so you kill two hares with one shot so you presumably will have seen this um uh, this now why i want i i like ukraine myself you know, I find Ukrainian is a wonderful thing to learn because it is a cocktail of lots of different languages, which I also love. So I love Russian, I also love Polish, and I love Czech as well. And I find for me, learning Ukrainian is like a combination of, you know, Russian and, you know, Polish with, uh, as we would say in English, with a twist of Czech, which makes it a, a good fun to learn. But Apart from the pleasure of learning languages, I also think that we can make um, a difference. Uh, I stole the title from this conference from my friend uh, uh, Carlos, who is a, also a, a, a big, a very, he's very good at languages, and he has a very good channel called the Hyperpolyglot Activists, where he stimulates people to think about languages. You should definitely check him out. And I think that we can you know, make a difference uh, by learning languages. Um, not just in the sense of tr helping to transmit information by you know, translating documents or interpreting for people, but there's also a human you know, aspect to language. Um, many, may, you may know the quote by Nelson Mandela, who was a polyglot himself. If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. And if you talk to him in his language, you know, that goes to his heart. So... Um, he, Nelson Mandela really understood the emotional power of language. And here are two examples. So from one person who works with Ukrainian visitors, she said, you know, speaking their language makes such a difference to those arriving and visibly reduces their fear and anxiety. OK, so, you know, just by welcoming mm -hmm. people in their language, you can make a big difference. Now, some of you may recognize the lady uh, in the, uh, on the right-hand side. Now, if you listen to her speaking, I would never have guessed that she is Ukrainian. She sounds just like somebody from Lancashire. There's, an, there's an, as an, really an excellent level of English. But when I wrote a short message to her, 
in Ukrainian on a video message, I got of this reaction. Now, if I had written in English, I would have certainly have not have got received this symbol. But it just shows that you know language is not more than exchanging information. If we if it was just information, then you know I could have just said it in, in English. And then she would have replied in English much better than I would have spoken in Ukrainian. But you, know, you can really touch people by speaking their language, even if you speak it badly, which brings to another, another point made by Kato Lomb. And she was one of the first simultaneous um, uh, translate interpreters at the United Nations who could translate in 10 languages sort of simultaneously. She said, language is the only thing worth knowing even badly because even badly spoken language can still help to build a bridge with people. And let me quote another person who's actually in the audience today, even bad Ukrainian is better than no Ukrainian. And that's completely right. Just sometimes just speaking one word of a language can help to build a bridge with somebody. So coming back to the objectives of today's uh, meeting, why, what I want to ask is, why is it worth learning Ukrainian? The question may be asked by those who are collaborating, you know, with Ukrainians in the United Kingdom. Another question is, how can we learn Ukrainians to help Ukrainians more effectively? That's a question that would be asked me to our you know, Ukrainian visitors. And also, you know, we're a lot of us are here because we love learning Ukrainian. You know, how can we improve our Ukrainian? So how can those of us who are learning Ukrainian to different degrees you know, share experience in order to raise our level. And also the function of a conference is to network. It's to, you know, meet other people, you know, share your experience. So I hope it will be useful from that point of view as well. Okay, so a quick presentation of the uh, the program today. We have three sessions. Uh, in our first session, you know, we'll have, um, we'll be aimed at, you know, why you know we uh, it's worth you know learning Ukrainian? We have three talks. We then have three talks, uh, well, four talks in in the middle, more about how we can learn Ukrainian. And in the last part, we have you know two amazing guys who are really good at Ukraine, and I hope will inspire us to become better you know at Ukrainian. So to introduce uh, quickly, uh, uh, you only have to tolerate me for a few minutes. But then we'll have a, a very, uh, we're going to have a respond crisis translation, a very good um, organization which helps with uh, interpreting and translation in situations of crisis. We have Tatiana Grigoyeva and Kate Taran, who are the team leads for Ukrainian and Russian. They'll be telling us of, about their uh, their work. Also um, from uh, Warsaw, uh, Albert Jerzy Wierzbicki will be telling us about how he organizes uh, tours to help Ukrainian refugees in Warsaw. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Kimberly Maria Skliner, who will talk us to, uh, to us about you know, the history of the, we, there's a lot of attention paid, of course, to Ukrainians who have arrived recently, but the Ukrainian community in the United Kingdom is actually much longer, and Kim will give her, her insights into that. Then uh, some of you, I'm sure many of you will have heard of uh, Ina Sopronchuk, uh, a YouTuber who has uh, pre makes a lot of you know, useful videos on how to learn Ukrainian. She'll be telling us about how we can learn Ukrainian. Also, Marta Melnik, uh, a polyglot from Ukraine, uh, who's also an IT specialist, will also be telling us about her experiences in learning her own uh, language. Then we will have a talk by Martin Hasman from Praha, about how he's uniting volunteers from technology and languages in order to make an app that can aid communication between Ukrainians and people from other countries. And then uh, Ruth Darby, a very interesting approach about how she's learning Ukrainian and are helping other people to learn sort of Ukrainian as they're helping other to people to learn English, or more specifically, how teachers in schools can help pupils learn English, but then you learn Ukrainian at the same time. So again, killing two birds with one stone. And then uh, Francesco Bruno is uh, um, from Italy, but he's uh, really, really good at Slavic languages, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian, etc. I would love to speak Slavic languages as well as him one day. And another really um, impressive guy, Shimon Kasperek, uh, he's very good at Slavic, well, actually, he's very good at all European languages. I think he speaks over 16. And he will be telling us about how his, his experiences of teaching Ukrainians, sort of to uh, teaching Polish, his language, you know, to Ukrainians. 
then I will keep this short, I promise. So finally, some practical matters. We I'm delighted that we have about 20 people attending in person and about 50 people online from countries like the USA and I think from Poland, from Japan. You're very welcome to ask your questions in the chat, okay, people online. In the breaks, we'll keep the meeting open so you can chat and network with each other. The talks are being recorded unless somebody doesn't want their talk to be recorded. This is obvious. Please turn off your camera and please turn off your microphone if you are not presenting. Thank you very much. Again, please turn off your camera and please turn off your microphone if you're not presenting. Thank you very much. We'll send a questionnaire to everybody at the end with feedback to ask how we might move on from this. This is also an experiment. So uh, very scientifically, I decided let's have a conference and let's see what happens. <laughs> But I'm very interested in hearing you know, your input as well to see you know, how can we um, learn Ukrainian better, but also more importantly, learn Ukrainian better in order to make a difference. Okay. And two people I'd like to thank, so Derek Hurd, the head of the Department of Languages and Cultures here, who has um, uh, you know, been very supportive of this initiative, and also Chris Coy, who's here, who did a lot of the nice designs you will see in your booklet and also in this presentation. Thank you, Chris, for doing so much at such short notice. And finally, you know, thanks to you for being so interested in uh, Ukrainian uh, in general. You know, we can't if you don't have uh, you, if you don't have participants, you can't have a conference. And duže vam děkuji, že vy vyřešili zo přijatí zo as a donast or nashaho malinkoho as a mastichko, is uh we online we tak as a myata um stilky enthusiasm do vivchenia as a ukrainsko top shit. Okay, duje diaku to uh um so having said that I will stop sharing my screen now and I will ask um uh Kate uh Taran and uh Tatiana Grigorieva to share their screen and uh start of our conference. Uh, you can hear my screen. Yeah, you can see my screen, can you? No. I, I can see your image, but I can't see the presentation yet. Uh, not the screen yet, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, we now respond crisis translation. So, whenever you're ready, please uh, fire away. Yeah. Okay. Um, доброго вечора, ми з України. And uh, hello, my name is Tatiana Grigorieva, and uh, Kate Taran, my colleague, and me, we are going to uh, present the respond crisis translation here. Um, I will start and uh, then I will pass the word to Kate. So I'm a um, team lead of Ukrainian and Russian languages in Respond Crisis Translation, and I inherited this role from, from Kate, who founded this team and started it uh, when the most difficult times were uh, from the beginning of the war. So, and I want to speak about the language first and uh, how it made its evolution um, evolution recently. Language is the biggest treasure that every person and ethnos has. Without the language, there is no nation. The language is called DNA of the nation. And I would want to mention the words of Ukrainian poet as Lina Kostenko. Nations, nations don't die of a heart attack. First, they're deprived of their languages. After centuries of linguicides organized by Russia, uh, it led to that led to language occupation of most part of Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian language started a counterattack, a new counterattack. With the start of Russian aggression uh, in 2014, which was announced as a of the Russian language, it had the opposite effect. Ukrainians adopted the Ukrainian language and used it, used it as a shield and sword. Um, 
at the beginning of the full scale invasion of to Ukraine in uh, 24 February 2022, Ukrainian language boosted its evolution as a of a mass usage. Um, Tim, just uh, I'm sorry, wanted to mention that I sent you Ukrainian version of the speech. If anybody wants to read it in Ukrainian. Um, First of all, language became as identify, identifying marker, marker at the battlefield of ours and the enemy. Uh, Ukrainian words like Palanitsa, Ukrizalizhnitsa, Nisanitnitsa, and Hustinka, and so on and so forth, they were used as a challenge and respond like uh, parole, password, because uh, native Russian speakers could not pronounce it. Due, due to the phonetic peculiarities. And everybody started um, supporting the defenders of Ukrainian land, and that gave a boost of using Ukrainian as a spoken languages in a mess. Internet exploded with the language memes and jokes. So that's what we called Palanitsa and Ukrzalizhnitsa, and I just posted some of the memes. Not all of them show up on the screen, though. Um, Ukrainian language became as a marker of national identity. The more bloody was Russian aggression and genocide against Ukrainian people, the more people of Ukraine united as never before. The Resilient courage in resisting Russian invasion, Ukrainian bravery and heroism while defending the motherland and fighting for self identity, for being as Ukrainian and Ukrainian land became legendary. Ukrainian language becomes not only the official language in Ukraine, but everyday spoken language at the most of Ukrainian territory. It becomes trendy to speak Ukrainian. Most Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians, most of Russian speaking Ukrainians started speaking Ukrainians. Most of Ukrainian role models, speakers, psychologists, bloggers who spoke Russian before switched to speaking and teaching in Ukrainian. Um, the biggest Ukrainian printing edition, uh, New Time, Novaya Vrema, Novy Chas, uh, which is my favorite, started publishing first of all in Ukrainian, only then in English and Russian translation. A lot of my friends that were absolutely Russian speaking started speaking Ukrainian, post on social media in Ukrainian, and it was amazing. It was unbelievable transformation. Um, and just a few days ago, on July 14th, the new provision of law of Ukraine on ensuring the function of Ukrainian language as a state, uh, as a state language uh, became effective. According to these provisions, the use of Ukrainian language, which is a state language of Ukraine, will be mandatory in computer programs and websites, including the websites of foreign companies selling goods and services in Ukraine. Um, I'm, uh, I was born in a Russian speaking family myself. I was born in Donetsk. Um, so I spoke both languages uh, since childhood, and um, I support all the Russian speakers are in Ukraine and everywhere all over the world, but I would like to celebrate success of the breakthrough of Ukrainian language as a language uh, of a nation's self-identity. Um, since the beginning of full-scale Russian invasion, 15 millions of Ukrainians had to flee the war. This is uh, uh, according to UNESCO statistics. The first problem when uh, people run and enter new country is a language. Um, you have registered a new place, you have to find a place to live, you have to buy food, uh, there are medical emergencies, there are humanitarian emergencies, children need to go to school, students need to go, students need to go to the university. Um, 
And here the language became the first priority and translation from between Ukrainian and all the other languages of all those other countries where uh, Ukrainian refugees had run. Hundreds of organizations from the entire world reacted immediately to provide humanitarian assistance, medical assistance, and just to help people. In Ukraine, in those countries that host, host those 15 million refugees. And uh, again, this is undoable without communication, meaning it's uh, communicating between Ukrainian and other languages. It means translation between other languages and translation. And here we see how language is a number one tool for all of number one tool to help for all of those people and all of those organizations trying to collaborate with Ukraine and help to Ukrainians. And here I want to present my organization that I work for. It's Respond Crisis Translation. Respond Crisis Translation is a collective collective of language activists providing compassionate, effective and trauma-informed interpretation and translation services for migrants, refugees and anyone experiencing language bar barriers. We mobilize to provide fast, accurate, empathetic translation, interpretation and language services of any kind amongst legal, medical or personal crisis. We serve NGOs, uh, let me just switch the slides. We serve um, NGOs, human rights groups, and lawyers, clinics, activist collectives, therapists, nonprofits, school networks that provide support to refugees and asylum seekers. We also provide direct support to independent clients. Um, what it means? It means that like any any refugee, any person in Ukraine or anywhere in the world can refer to Respond Crisis Translation and ask with the help of translating documents or interpreting. In fact, uh, Respond Crisis Translation uh, provi provides uh, translation and interpretation services um, for 150 languages. So Russian, Ukrainian team is very new. Uh, basically, Ukrainian team started uh, after full-scale uh, Russian invasion, after February 24. Um, so, here I posted, we posted some... testimonials from organizations and from refugees. Uh, that we um, helped and uh, did translation. So we see like people are requesting, even Russian speaking Ukrainians requesting help translating documents to Ukrainians. Um, millions of Ukrainians had to apply for an asset. Organization, the Ukrainian organization. Those applicants and lawyer organization um, also refer to Respond Crisis Translation for our essence in translating this document. And um, here I listed um, um, our fields where we were pro able to provide help and uh, we provided translation interpretation for more than eight languages from Ukrainian to eight languages and to give some statistics um, uh, since February 24 uh, we served more than 75 individual clients translated more than 500 pages of text provided more than 1703 hours of interpretation um, and there are more, there are more than um, 400 volunteers, translators in our team. Uh, I would like to pass the word to my colleague Kate Taran, uh, who started the team and who will speak.
speak more our volunteers. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you well, Kate. Hear you, Kate. Awesome. It's really nice to uh, join this conference. Thank you very much for uh, organizing it. I just wanted to add a couple of words to uh, Tina's presentation about our team at Respond Crisis Translation. Um, we currently have uh, four project managers and one person that does proofreading when we do various translations. Um, we have 100 uh, volunteers that are registered with us to do translations in Ukrainian, and we have over 300 translators in, uh, that can translate Russian, and that's like Ukrainian, Russian to English or backward. Um, of course, all of these people are volunteers, so they can um, provide different time commitment, different professionalism levels. Um, we have people from all kinds of backgrounds. Some are professional translators or interpreters that are actually certified. And some people are um, just bilingual or maybe students that want to learn the language and practice their skills. So this is you know, a win-win situation because we actually help people, but also they get to um, practice their speaking, writing skills. Um, so yeah, uh, we're always welcoming more people because even though it does sound like we have a lot of people on our team, um, we, we always welcome more because there are all kinds of uh, requests coming in, different levels, um, different people are all over the world, so different time zones, and we, we would love for you to join. You know, it could be a motivation for you to learn Ukrainian, um, or any friends that you know, please please join us. There is a link um, on the slide that you can fill in with your information and we would get in touch with you. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. And thank you again for this conference. And uh, thank you, Kate. And I wanted also to thank very much team uh, team is one of the activists and uh, trans and activist and volunteer with our voluntary organization Respond Crisis Translation, and I, a team I'm really grateful personally and on behalf of my organization uh, for you organizing this conference and um, promote learning of Ukrainian languages, and um, I'm grateful as a Ukrainian and I'm grateful as a um, activist of uh, Respond Crisis Translation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tatiana and uh, Kate, for this uh, presentation. I can uh, confirm what you know. Kate mentioned that you know, doing translation work is very good from the point of view of a language learner, and I've learned a lot, you know, from the experience. Uh, somebody who's worth definitely checking out as well is the founder of Re uh, Respond Crisis. Le crisis translation, uh, a lady called Ariel Cohen, who's, you know, very passionate about, you know, making a difference, uh, you know, through, um, through translations. And I know that Respond does uh, translation work in many, many languages as well. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a demand for translators uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, also a lots of Europe other European languages and Asian languages as well. Um, do we have any questions uh, for Kate and Tatiana? You, if you're online, you may write them in the chat. Um, or may, does somebody here in Lancaster have a question? Yes, we have a question from Oleg Kolosov. Please, Oleg, uh, unmute mute yourself and... Uh, yeah, yeah, give a mute. Yeah, so the question is with translation, because these days you can effectively type in Google quite a few things, and even it can start speaking Ukrainian there. Is it still uh, useful to have, okay, of course it's useful for the personal things, right? Sort of for the, or the thing, but it's, uh, does it help you, for example, this kind of Google thing and uh, also automatic translation, you can even speak and then get the Ukrainian back. 
Uh, what is your question if like uh, how respond crisis translation is different? No, no, no. Um, the, the question is like there are many technical tools, right? In addition to the just the personal translation in the brain, right? And these technical tools yeah. really, really could be very helpful, uh, both for the crisis translation and for the actually helping you in your work, or you don't uh, need them. We definitely, um, I definitely would want to learn about more uh, automatic or automatic translation tools. Uh, I will just uh, describe. So, how is different if a person wants to translate? their documents organization with Google Translate from different from Respond Crisis Translation. So uh, all our translators sign confidentiality agreements, so in, no information leaks out. And also uh, we have different uh, levels of uh, knowledge in translating. Uh, we do a screening uh, to enter, so we make sure that quality of translation is there. We always have a proofreader in any language uh, that proofread that translation was a good quality. And um, at the same time, um, what else did I want to mention? Um, we have also certified translators. So depending on the level of translations you need, and we give a certificate of translation. For example, if it's translation, translation of documents to be registered in any country or any kind of documents for court or for anything else, medical documents. So um, we provide certificate of translation. So when you bring those documents to institution, uh, this translation is certified. Um, if, if I understood the question correctly, but if your question is whether we are willing to adopt new like um, automatic translation skills, uh, we would be really happy to learn more about that. And uh, I would be personally happy to get involved and learn about more tools and uh, get our translators and our team trained on a new uh, tools, which is uh, really useful to know about the new technology and use it. But you don't use it at the moment, correct? Uh, at the moment, we have a number of translators. They do translation. They do translations on based on their knowledge. Okay. And we have a proofreader or specialists in specific fields. For example, court translator, uh, medical translator that proofread that all uh, the translator translation overall is of a good quality and all the terms, specific terms, are translated correctly. Okay. Um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to add to yeah. that, uh, that uh, we don't really track exactly how uh, or which techniques each translator uses. So, you know, they're welcome because some of them are professionals, they have their own methods and, you know, we, we allow them to do that, but we don't really track exactly how they do the translation and which, you know, Technologies they use, but uh, definitely that would be um, something to just to, to explore more uh, for the future. Yeah. All right. Thanks. If you if you have any technologies to share, I would be uh, grateful if you involve us and share. And uh, if there are any training opportunities for our translators, we would very welcome. We would very welcome it. All right. Cheers. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, are there any more questions? Right. Well, um, I think the new. Uh, um, so, uh, so the next talk will then be given by uh, Albert uh, Jerzy Wierbrzycki. So, uh, Albert, are you here? Right. It appears that Albert uh, is not in the meeting room. In that case, I suggest we go on to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Kimberly Marie Sklinner. Uh, Kim, are you ready to present? I am, yeah. Hi. Yes. So, um, uh, thank you, uh, Tanya. Could you stop sharing? I, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to stop presenting. OK, I found it. How? OK, thank you very much. OK, yes. We are still recording, by the way. and. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, Kim, you also win the prize for the best dressed speaker so far. 
And we, yes, a gent, I also have a gentleman in the audience who is the, the best dressed uh, uh, attendee. So, yeah, so whenever you're ready, Kim, please um, uh, tell us about uh, the short history of the, the British Ukrainian community uh, in the UK. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you, Tim, for introducing me. Um, so I'm going to talk about a short history of the British Ukrainian community in the UK. Um, as you can see, my name is Kimberly Marie Gunner. I am a member of the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, and I'm also a Ukrainian language student. So I'm going to give a bit about my personal experience growing up as a British Ukrainian in the UK, and also learning Ukrainian as a heritage language, um, rather than growing up being taught it. So firstly, a little bit about me, uh, that is me looking um, terribly cute in my uh, Ukrainian dancing outfit when I was a kid. So I'm a third generation British Ukrainian. My granddad came over from Ukraine after the Second World War and settled here. Um, he's one of the founding members of the Huddersfield branch of the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain that really rolled off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, I grew up in the Ukrainian community in Huddersfield. Um, in the north of England, there's quite a lot of towns like Huddersfield, um, Bradford, Halifax, um, Stockport, Manchester, lots of um, Ukrainian communities, but there are some all over the UK. Um, so some of the things I, things I did as part of the community was I did Ukrainian dancing for 10 years and we competed against other clubs across the UK, um, small venues, big venues. I performed at the Demontfort Hall when I was probably about 10. Um, and I've been learning Ukrainian since 2019. I forgot to check, you can see these slides, can't you? Yes, we can see the slides Thank clearly. You. Thank you. Great stuff. So um, you may have noticed that my surname is a bit strange looking as well. That is um, thanks, Grandad, for that one. Um, so a bit about the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, or the AUGB, as I'm going to call it from now on. Um, it was founded in 1946 um, by Ukrainians who served in the Polish Armed Forces. There were also members of Ukrainian displaced persons and prisoners of war as well. Um, so my granddad fits into that group of people. Um, they came to the UK. They all found um, a safe haven here. They settled. They had families. They had jobs. Their careers bought houses, and formed communities because, without going into too much history, they didn't want to go back home. Didn't feel they could be able to go back home. Ukraine. It was the Soviet Union at the time. Um, so it was very much about creating that home from home, a place where you speak your language, where you celebrate your roots, your culture, your food, your events, your religion, your celebrations, all those little things that make you part of your a part of your identity. Um, and I grew up in that. So and for me, that the community is just I can't explain it because I've never not had it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a part of who I am as a person. So what does the AUGB do? They promote and support the Ukrainian community and people of Ukrainian descent like me. Um, they foster Ukrainian knowledge, arts, culture, our heritage, traditions. It's about promoting intercultural understanding between Ukrainians and British people and other ethnic communities in the UK as well. Um, there's lots of the things they do. They provide advice and welfare and assistance to um, Ukrainians in need, including Ukrainians in Ukraine. Um, long term things are supporting charities over there prior to the um, the recent events. There's over 25 branches in the UK at present, I believe, and there's a head office in London. There's a big collection of diaspora publications and all sorts of the bits and pieces, and they work with the British Library and other institutions as well. So it's a real place or an organisation that celebrates and cements Ukrainians in the UK. And as I said, I'm a member of the Huddersfield branch. Um, we, just, we don't call it Huddersfield Ukrainian Club. We call it club or if you're Yorkshire like me, it's club. So this is our home. Um, so like many Ukrainian communities in the UK, you would, you would be living in plain sight. You, you can't look at me and it's, you know, say that I'm Ukrainian. So, um, you know, we saw, you know, this you know, building that's just been there and hidden in beautiful grounds and all of a sudden very recently and people have realised that we're there. Um, but it's a beautiful building and um, our families have been there since the 50s. They had a building somewhere else and they moved here in the 50s, I believe. I may have got that wrong. If anyone from my community is watching this, I apologise for getting that incorrect. Um, 
but yeah the older I've become the more aware I've been of Ukraine and Ukrainian culture and the impact it's had on me as a person we have over 100 members who are member of this building um this community plus non-members as well as spouses children friends family etc who um join at various events and if you're interested in learning more about Ukrainian culture there may well be a Ukrainian community near you and you go to the, the it's, there's an AUGB website I think it's augb.org.uk, I may be wrong, but go and have a look and you know, go and meet them. You don't have to be of Ukrainian descent to participate and join in and, and get to know the community as well. So quickly some photos of promoting Ukrainian culture. Um, so my granddad is uh, one of the um, old gentlemen on the left there in the black and white photo, but throughout the year, our committee put on various events such as cooking lessons. We um, we teach people who don't know how to make Vereniki to make Vereniki. There's live music, there's religious events, there's an annual volleyball competition, we celebrate Independence Day, Svativeci, Malanka, and we do language lessons as well. And we also have a dance troupe that performs at events across the UK. Um, and this is, I don't know, I've always known this place, it's just a part of who I am. But recently, we had to do a bit more. Since the, um, I don't know, if you think back to the time when our community came together after the Second World War, you could really say it's come full circle. Um, the world has become more aware of Ukraine as a country and a language, and that's why we're here. Um, but the, when the Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, it really impacted our community. We started fundraising for equipment. Some people volunteered abroad. I went to Poland for a little bit. Um, some of our members spoke to national and local media. So that's Lydia, my Ukrainian teacher. And speaking to the news, terrified for her family. Um, we lobbied, we invited um, MPs and the Mayor of West York, Tracy Brabin, to come meet our community and talk to us about our concerns, our worries and what they could do to help us. And people looking to take in Ukrainian refugees wanted to start contacting us, wanting to know more about the culture and the language and, and were contacting us, you know, how can they support? So there's a lot of signposting going on. Um, and now we're working with the local community to support families who are taking in refugees and also refugees with a welcome club. Um, for several days a week, people can come and learn English and have that home from home that we created in the 40s, um, because that's what the club was for our grandparents and for our parents. So our community is growing again, not for the right reasons, but for the same reasons. And isn't that what community is about, sticking up for each other and and being together when things are always as good. So finally, I'm going to get relevant to the, <laughs> relevant to um, why we're here at this conference. Um, the community helped me rediscover the Ukrainian language because I was one of many British Ukrainians who was not taught the language as a child. Um, it's often one of our parents' first languages. It was my dad's. He um, spoke English four years old, I think, when he went to school. I don't think he could speak much English, even though he was, he was British. Um, I listened to Ukrainian a lot when I was growing up. Um, my family thought that French or Spanish or something like that was going to be more useful to me. So they didn't teach me Ukrainian. It's like, what's, the, what's the point in that? You're not going to use it. Um, and also, you know, my mum's English. So my dad's Ukrainian, my mum's English. So it's also a bit hard when you've got one parent. Um, but it's tough because the, Ukraine, the Ukrainian language that my granddad brought from Ukraine was different to the Ukrainian that people are learning now. So my mum, my mum could follow conversations of things that were being said because of those English words peppering conversations. It would be blah, 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 washing machine, blah, 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 fridge freezer, because my granddad didn't have those words in his Ukrainian language vocabulary. They were invented or he didn't have them in his home in the mountains. So my, it's, it's odd that those words didn't exist and he, so he speaks a different version of Ukrainian to, I guess, I guess, modern Ukrainian because you think all the things that have been invented since the 40s. Um, but also many of our community are from Western Ukraine, which means the dialect involved as well. Um, I'm from a subgroup of ethnic Ukrainians called Boykos that are from the Carpathian Mountains and they have a very strong dialect. So if I'd have learned Ukrainian as a child, it would be different to the Ukrainian I'm learning now. And, and also many of us are in contact with our families over there because of you know, wars and what's happened, people lost touch with people. So 
it's 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 tough but um i did find my relatives in ukraine and when i wanted to speak to them on the phone i couldn't i have to use google translate to whatsapp them when i went to meet them in real life i had to hire a translator which was really embarrassing that i couldn't speak to my own flesh and blood in in a, in a language that should connect us um, but the Ukrainian club in Huddersfield recently in 2019 started putting on Ukrainian classes, which is amazing. And people, other people like me came out of the woodwork who had connected with their family or wanted to connect with their family and felt that language is such a part of your culture. Um, so the classes are now still going. Um, we've all become friends, actually. That's the group that's on the screen you can see there. And um, we intend to visit Ukraine together as soon as we can to practice our language skills and obviously show off to our families. Um, but it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because just because you have this in your blood doesn't mean you are taught the language, if that makes any sense. So as Tanya said um, prior to me, language is a part of our identity. It's part of our culture. Um, we're far, far from Ukraine. But we were raised in the Ukrainian community and, and recent events only make us prouder to be Ukrainian. So language connects us. Isn't that why we're all here? Thank you very much. Anyone got any questions? Yes, uh, uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Kim, for sharing your as a story and uh, with us. Are there any questions uh, either in the chat online or here in Lancaster? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. Um, you yeah, just okay. I tell you what. Uh, maybe you could speak into my microphone. Good evening. I come from Bradford, so I've been with the Bradford community for 50 years. So, uh, um, I have wanted to um, go to Ukrainian classes in Bradford. I live in the Yorkshire Dales, and I think it'd be a good point now if the Yorkshire clubs, I'm just saying Yorkshire because I live in Yorkshire, could get an online uh, set of classes online so that people in the lakes and the dales and far away could could take Ukrainian lessons because I'm looking at lots and lots of different websites but you hit upon something very important my stepfather spoke the same language uh, the old language that you know the pre-war language uh, that your parents did and it is a lot different um, and I'm having to play catch-up because my wife uh, for 40 years said what's the point in learning Ukrainian so uh, you're never going to live in Ukraine so it would be a good thing if the Yorkshire if Huddersfield and Bradford say uh, got together with Manchester and created some sort of uh, regular classes and perhaps circulate around a hub once a month, Manchester, Huddersfield, Bradford. Just an idea. Great idea, absolutely great idea. Okay. Thank you, I'll, I'll, feed, I'll feed that back to our, to our community. Um, it's interesting because I don't want to bog down too much in AUGB but, um, or the community, but um, it is interesting having, you know, we, we have an hour lesson, it is online at the moment um, because we just never recovered after COVID. But, you know, we don't always chat Ukrainian for an hour. There'll be 15 minutes at the start where we'll talk about something cultural or we'll just have that little nuance of something. And it's just nice having, going to a Ukrainian class where I didn't have that little, those idiosyncrasies would be different, but it just feels there's just something extra connecting us there. So uh, thank you so much for your question. We have a question in the chat. Well, um, we have three questions from, uh, firstly, from Oleg. I wonder when the speaker has the chance to speak to Ukrainians, I guess. Thank you. That's a really good point. So uh, we have a Ukrainian teacher. Um, and I also, during COVID, I've used an app called italki to find a um, an Ukrainian pen pal online. Um, I speak to mum, I speak to my own mum. And mum, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry. I speak to Katya once a week five o'clock every Monday. Um, so I, I practice with her, we, we, she speaks great English, we do half an hour English, half an hour Ukrainian. And like I said in the previous answer, that also connects me to my heritage. I can ask strange questions about what does this mean? Or my grandparents used to say this word, this weird little word. Like for example, my grandma used to call her dog a greedy botchka. And I never knew what a botchka was. It turns out it means barrel, who knew? <laughs> and having that little conversation with my Ukrainian friend was just, I don't know, just something a little bit different. Um, but it also connects into current Ukraine as well, you know, what's happening in the news, their response to COVID, loads of things like that. Um, really good question. I want to speak to more Ukrainians. I'm going to have to sign up for the translation, um, the translation thing. We have another question. Uh, 
Thank you. What was the region you mentioned in the Carpathians? So um, the region, um, my, and my family are from a, a small village near a town called Drohovic, which is about two hours south of Lviv, um, sub-Carpathia. But um, I think I mentioned the word Boyko. So it's not, it is a region, I guess. Um, there's three sort of subgroups of people in that part of Ukraine, Hutzels, Lemkos and Boykos. Um, I'm going to get this slightly incorrect, but the sort of where Poland meets Ukraine, the borders have moved back and forth. It's based all around there. Um, so if, if that's what you mean. There's not much published about them online in English. So I'm all the more reason to read Ukrainians. I can find out about my people. Very good that you mentioned that. That's actually sometimes true in science as well, that all, not all the information you want is in English. Uh, another, one more question from Alieg. Um, any online resources to learn Ukrainian? Oh, good question. So well, I'm a big fan of um, the Ukrainian Lessons podcast. Um, also, Inna from Speak Ukrainian, who I know is here as well, um, fangirling a little bit because I'm a big fan of her YouTube channel. Um, I think it's good to, you know, when you can't speak to Ukrainians, you can still have that pronunciation and you can pause and replay and pause and replay rather than asking a friend going, can you say that one more time? Can you say that one more time? Um, although saying that, uh, one thing I do practice with my friend is reading. So she listens to me read, I record myself reading and then she corrects it and she'll say it back, etc. So Depends what you mean online, as in real time online or reading online, but there's a lot out there for sure. Okay, any more questions? Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know who it will, will it be better in English or Ukrainian. I have been to Ukraine 30 years ago. Which means I left Ukraine 30 years ago. <laughs> I, heard, I heard a little bit there. Oh, wow. So yes. You, you so I love Ukraine all Ukrainians. In order not to forget Ukrainian, I very often use YouTube and listen to news channels. Because news channels obviously give you the latest, you know, so even so you could hear your parents and grandparents talking in Ukrainian, other language. It's not anymore the Ukrainian language. It's their Ukrainian language. I yeah. find for myself, it's easier to actually continue with Ukrainian by listening the news and by listening the music. Yeah, that's a good it's point. Ukrainian music is definitely okay. something that's helped me because you can look up the lyrics as well. One more question. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Hi there. Um, I actually wanted to share that um, what I really like as well, I've been to the Ukraine many times, but I speak Russian, but I understand Ukrainian. Um, what I really enjoy as a method as well, it's ukrainianlessons.com. It's from Anna Oigonka. It's pretty known. Really check it out for those because she also creates, it's not her team, let's say, they also create like um, ebooks for learners. So yeah, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. So she, Anna, does the podcast as well. I think that's her online resource as well, which is great. The whole package together is awesome. She's great, isn't she? Yes. Well, if not, I'll just make one comment myself. One thing that I know heard several times during your presentation and afterwards was people saying, what do you want to learn that for with Ukraine? And yes, I've I've heard this many times from people, not not in connection with Ukrainian, but with other languages. And I'll say, if somebody says that to you, what do you what do you want to learn that for, or whatever, then that's a sign. Definitely learn that language. That makes it worth learning more, because somebody will ask you the same question. Oh, what did you learn that for? But not out of you know uh, contempt, but out of joy that you've done it. So it's a good sign. If that, that, the, that the fact that people are saying, what do you want to learn that for in Ukrainian? What do you want to learn Ukrainian for? That's, that's, that's the best, that's the reason why it's worth learning it. So it's, that's, that's a good sign. Every time you hear somebody saying that about a language, make sure you learn that language. Okay. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, Thank you for having me. Albert. Uh, is Albert here? Yes, this tut, Albert. Okay, well, 
In that case, uh, we'll, uh, unfortunately, Albert is not, uh, doesn't appear to have connected. So we'll make a pause here and then we'll, I'll stop the recording now. Okay, and then I'll start again when the second session starts.